I'm tired Let's of start. participating in dojo talks. I know I'm the best talker of all time, but I'll let the number two and number three talkers take over. Have a good show. All right, guys, here we go. This is Dojo Talks. Today, we're talking about the upcoming match between Ding Loren and Jan Nepomnesi. The match is starting in two days. First game is April 9th in Astana, Kazakhstan. Uh, we're going to talk about our feelings on the match, um, whether this match is political, who we think is going to win at the end, and uh, so on. Um, but yeah, this is the... Uh, the FIDE World Championship match, as uh, many of you know, Magnus Carlsen gave up his title, announced it uh, last year, and he was originally supposed to play Jan Nepomnesi, who won the candidates for the match, but Magnus decided to give his title. We did a couple of episodes about that already, and mm -hmm. instead the second challenger spot went to Ding Laurent, who finished second in the candidates. So it's, uh, it's the battle of the unstoppable minds, as they're calling it. What happens when an unstoppable mind meets an unstoppable mind? I guess we're going to find out over the next two weeks. And I think uh, we've found out 80 plus percent of the time in recent top level tournaments. <laughs> we're gonna, well, we're going to we're going to discuss it all. Um, let's see. It's a 14 game match and the time control, because I feel like this is going to be um, important later on when we talk about uh, FIDE's promotional skills, it's a uh, very unusual time control. It's three time controls. You get extra time on move 40, you get extra time on move 60, and you don't get any 30 second increment until move 61. So it's yeah. one of these weird time controls that they pull out every once in a while. <laughs> yeah. It should have been a Grishuk Ivanchuk World Championship match with this time control. It's, I think that's what they were kind of hoping for. Um, yeah. But okay, I think that's all the info that people need. I don't know. Did I miss yeah. anything? No, no. You did a nice job foreshadowing FIDE's promotional skills with that, with, with that label, Unstoppable Minds, <laughs> whatever the heck those are. <laughs> but yes, great intro, Kos. Yeah, you did all it. Right. Well then, we okay. Move on. Let's move on to perhaps like the most... Um, common, you know, question topic that, that people are kind of discussing when this match comes up. Actually, people already in our chat were like, oh, can't wait to see, you know, who's the number two best player in the world. Guys, is this a real world championship? Let me throw it to Jesse. Uh, no, <laughs> it's not a real world championship, but I, I I'm, am conflicted on this one because Magnus blew it so hard by doing this to us. And he screwed us in two ways. One, giving us this thing, which technically is hard to not call it a world championship in some technical sense. Is it a world champion in that we're going to discover who's the best? No, no. So that's a problem. And then it's this whole political uh, chaos that we're going to have to talk about, too. So by putting it behind what might become the new Iron Curtain, we're like bifurcating chess in a really terrible way between the Western world and the Iron Curtain world or whatever you want to call it. So thank you, Magnus. Thank you, buddy. Um, the other piece of info that I think is kind of interesting is one thing I was wondering is like, well, where's the money coming from? It's a little bit unclear, but kind of hilariously, the, the price fund is exactly what it was the last time around, which is 2 million euros. And mm -hmm. was remarkable. A couple of things are remarkable about that is like one, how very uncreative Fide. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. can you tell us where? Like, it, are there the sponsors? Where does the money come from? And shouldn't it be going up? Or is it an achievement that they in fact kept it at two million because the interest in this match is just much less than the last one? Mm -hmm. um, and then the other thing I thought was really interesting about that was like, Magnus, buddy. I appreciate to you that, and by the way, the, the, the price fund is always split 60-40. So, so worst case scenario, the loser walks away with 800000 Okay? Magnus, hey, right here. Buddy, you're just going to toss 800,000 euros out like you're just chump change? <laughs> like, what are you doing? I mean, that's like letting me cake to the rest of the world, buddy. 
I mean, eight hundred thousand. That's 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 kind of real money for us chumps out here, you know. And you're just gonna throw it away. So that's a third way I'm disappointing in you, Magnus. A third way. Anyway, he's definitely he's definitely throwing away the one point two, not the eight hundred. But aside from that, yeah, lots of interesting points, Jesse. Let me just ask you a quick clarifying question. Yeah. Karpov versus Korchnoi, nineteen seventy eight. Right. Was that a real world championship match? Um, I think that is the one we need to talk about as the comparison. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the reasons I have to admit that this is like technically a world championship match is it's so close to that one. Mm -hmm. The difference, I think, is there were legitimate claims that Karpov was at a level where he could at least challenge Fisher, right? And there's a bunch of questions, like what would have happened in Fisher, uh, Karpov, 1974, a lot of people have questions about it. And I certainly think that even though Fisher was losing his mind, it was also partly fear of facing Karpov, especially after having partied his ass off, after having won the thing, going soft, uh, after the 1972 match that kept him from it. So the fact that he was afraid makes makes it feel more legitimate in the Karpov case. Now, was Magnus also afraid? I mean, Unlikely. I haven't. I, I, I just want to say, Magnus, I still don't get it, buddy. I still don't understand your motivations. And he was I'll afraid of wasting his time, Jesse. That's what he was afraid of. I mean, it's not just the 1.2 million you're leaving. I mean, it is a huge... I mean, a huge failure from every, from his legacy, from monetary, the other financial, I mean, the 1.2 is chump change to the amount that he's losing in terms of missed opportunities for marketing and whatever, you know? Look, Jesse, so, as yeah. a fellow millennial, okay, I'm a little, yeah. you know, closer to, to Magnus. Yeah. It's not about the money. It's not about the title. We honestly shouldn't talk about him too much because we already discussed what yeah. he did. Um, yeah. But it's about, you know, doing what he what he wants to do. But I want to say this situation is very different to the Karp of Korshnoi situation because mm -hmm. Fisher stopped playing, right? It was as if he died from the chess world. He stopped playing. And that's what, you know, okay, chess world has to move on. We have to find a new world champion. Magnus, though, he's still playing. He's still number one. He's a clear number one. He's still playing, right? So it's like, that's to me what makes this situation uh, very, very different. Hey, let me just say one thing about that. I think that's totally, there's differences, but also to go back in history, um, one of the reasons it took so long for us to get a world championship match officially, and that happened with Steinitz first an official level, is that nobody wanted to call themselves world champion while Morphe was still alive. It was a real thing. And like no, nobody was gonna call themselves world champion while the guy was still alive. And that guy had definitely stopped playing. <laughs> <laughs> I had definitely stopped playing. So, you know, I under, but I, of course, it's an important difference. Yeah, between Karpov and this one. And I definitely feel like the Karpov situation is much more clear that you can call that a world championship match, whereas this thing is just definitely an exhibition match in the sense that we're not deciding who the best player is. There's just no case to be made that either of these chumps are on the level, right? You know, there's a weird there's a weird thing about it, Jesse, where if they didn't call it a world championship match, but they called it an exhibition match. Yeah, it's almost like excitement and interest would have been higher. Right. Because right. If you th if you think about it, like if you suddenly heard that there was going to be, you know, a 14 game or 20 game match between two really top players mm -hmm. outside of the cycle, you just suddenly heard, you know, somebody announced, you know, we're going to have, you know, Dingley Ren against Nep. I mean, it's a great example. They're number two and three. Right. But if you tr let's try and imagine another time. Imagine when Kasparov's world champion and you heard there's going to be a 20 game match between Anand and Kromnik. You know, they're these up and coming players. One of them's probably going to succeed Kasparov at some point. Mm -hmm. They're really good and they're going to throw down for a huge match. You would be pumped to see that, right? And when I look at the top, you know, players in the world, I often think, man, I would love to see like a real match between these guys, right? Because we're missing the candidates, the actual candidates and everything, right? Well, that would be like glorious to see. So I think that if you took away the world championship question, somebody told you that Ding and Nepo were going to play a 20-game match, you would have thought, like, 
holy moly, that's hot. I want to see that, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they called it the World Championship, and then you set your expectation at, like, Kasparov Karpov or, you know, Fisher Spassky or something, and then you're like, oh, man, Magnus isn't there. Why am I watching this thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. Because the for- event on its own would have would is, you know, pretty intense. I mean, these guys are good. And on that note, let me just say, I, I love what we used to have, which was – you had to, back in the day, it wasn't a candidate's tournament. It was a cycle of matches, in which case, imagine if this was Ding playing Nepo to, to decide who gets to play Carlson. Oh, what an interesting match. What a match that would be, dude. And now, and, and honestly, I I have to admit, we'll talk, we have to talk about our, amongst ourselves too. Like, are we even interested in covering the match? And frankly, at this point, I'm not, dude. I'm not even that interested. You know, which and if is, this were a challengers match for who we're going to oh, play Magnus yeah. in two months, oh, we would have dojo coverage all up and down. Up it's and interesting, down. right? It's the same yeah. match, and it's just match, uh, yeah. something about the expectation disappointment thing that really messes with your appreciation of of a thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, as far as the, the question, the overall, <laughs> yeah, as far as the overall question here, is it a real world championship? I mean, I think there have been championship matches played before where the best player wasn't necessarily in the match, right? Um, Let's and, talk about it. Let's talk about it. So what, what does your mind go to when you when you say that? I mean, first of all, Fisher's, Fisher's absence, right? Okay, yeah. But then also, um, but then also after Kasparov, I mean, he was still the best player in the world. Um and even when he retired, he was still number one in the world, right? So there was some mm. period of time where Kramnik wouldn't play him and wanted to play somebody else, and things were kind of fractured. But, like, we had a dude going around who was clearly the best player in the world still, right? I mean, in the Best Games episode, you guys saw the clobbering he gave Kramnik in Astana. Um, so we had a dude, like, going around who was the best player in the world, and somebody else was world champion, and he couldn't play against the world champion. So it's happened before. You might also say some of the Lasker matches, mm. potentially, uh-huh. you know, the best player in the world wasn't involved. I don't I don't want to, like, fight about, about it in, yeah, like, yeah. too great detail, but the idea that the best player might not be the champion, I think, is possible. That's the reason why you have a world championship match and a world championship cycle is it's, like, a specific con- competition as opposed to just you know who's number one on the rating list, right? It's it's a it's a specific test, mm-hmm. um, which which uh, has its own interest and uh, and value. And of course, if you're the best player in the world, you've got a better chance to win it. But if it were just about who's the best player, then you know Caruana and Kramnik, uh, Caruana and Carlson would get to the uh, World Championship match and Caruana would shake hands with Magnus and say, congratulations, you're the best player. And I'm honored to have, you know, reached this this event with you. And let's just call it a one point win for you, you know. Right. I mean, you wouldn't even have to go through any of these paces if it were just who's the best player. Um, OK, let me I want to address just historical. So I think it's interesting with Kasparov. Let's, so let's just think about it for a second. So is, the match that we would be talking about as a, a, an ex- exhibition match would be Kramnik Lako 2003, right? Yeah. And in that match, a couple things though. Kramnik had already beaten Kasparov. Yeah. Kasparov's over 40 at that point, already hinting at retirement and doesn't go through the paces to qualify, thinks he should just automatically get it. Right. right. So, Yes, distinct situations, many distinct situations. I totally right, 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 I totally right, agree. Right. Like, I don't say that that's obviously the Fisher situation is sort of closer. But as Kosia pointed out, different because Fisher wasn't like going around winning every tournament that Karpov was in uh-huh. um, while they called him the world champion or something. But I mean, it's I, I still think the world championship as an event can exist without the best players. It more interesting to everybody. If the widely accepted first and second best players are in it, yes. But you could make a similar claim that if it's the world champion against the number four player, that somehow that's disappointing instead of number one versus number two, right? I think when Karyakin qualified for the world championship against Carlson, some people were disappointed that he wasn't playing against Caruana or Aronian 
um, at that at that point in in time. You know, some people were disappointed because I think Karyakin may have only been number fifteen or something in the world. He was a little bit lower than yeah, he yeah, yeah. is even now, right? So yeah, it was like number um, ten. Mm-hmm. So I think a lot of people were like, "Hey, it's not number one versus." even an arguable number two, right? Um, And so that could be a reason to be disappointed. But again, the event doesn't have to always be number one versus number two. It's extra excitement if you have that. But on its own, the world championship is as exciting as, you know, the format and the level of the players playing in it to some extent. And we had a lot of good players participate in the cycle up to this point. Um, most of the best players in the world would I prefer to see you know a longer set of matches than the candidates yes would I like the world championship match to be longer yes would I like them to play Fisher random so there were less draws yes would I like them to remove the rapid tiebreaker yes I mean we all have preferences about these things but I think you know whoever wins it is still going to be a reasonable um it's hard to say world champion which I guess undermines my (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> argument but but i still think it's uh it's an event it's a chess event <laughs> well and i certainly agree that the the winning of it will have historical it will have significance in the sense that that will set up the next cycle and then we have to see is it going to be a world cycle or is it going to be a, a world bifurcated cycle with two different things going on in the east and the west and then you know, will Carlson be reinvigorated to reclaim it or not? Good question, you know. Um, and then, of course, coming up, I think the new, uh, it, it, let's say Carlson, whether Carlson is there or not in the new cycle, the the young pups that are coming up now, I don't, I don't think, I don't know, they might just crack Carlson's head open. You know, we got some people coming up who are so strong that Carlson, buddy, you had your chance at the crown, buddy, and it's passing. <laughs> time is passing, my friend. Yeah. I think also, as you say, time passing, I think when time passes, this will ultimately be seen as a real world championship. Like, there have been all kinds of different circumstances for world championship matches. And I think 10, 20, 30 years down the road, they'll say, you know, oh, this was when so and so became world champion and their reign was this or that. I, I think when people look back, even when there are asterisks, like you see the asterisk less than, you know, whoever held the world championship title. Okay, but in, but I mostly agree. But however, let's just put it in historical context. When um, Kazim Zhanov wins the FIDE world championship, no one thinks of that now as a world championship. Or <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody out there that does. The I people just, writing FIDE don't... promotional materials. We can talk right. about that. But other than... Other than people in FIDE, I don't think there's a single chess fan, Kazim Janov included, who would think that he was the world champion ever. Well, it's funny. Those guys, like when you talk to, like Anand calls himself world champion for when he won the bogus one in 97 or whenever it was. And then Khalifman, like they all, like you win that event, you're going to call yourself world champion. (laughs) So there's going to be that guy. They're still going to be like, yes, congratulations. You won this weird knockout event. So I'm just saying, like, and you look on Wikipedia, it'll show it'll show two, whereas in my head, it's just one. Right. Yeah. Um, The problem is, of course, like this one, it's going to it's there was at least a parallel process back then, which was unfair, by the way. It was incredibly unfair what Kasparov did. And like, talk about Carlson screwing the pooch here. Kasparov ruined it in the 90s, you know, totally. (laughs) So you don't like any of the greatest chess players of all time, after all. Well, one of the things that I was reflecting on for this show that's really interesting is this is going to have political ramifications. And I think Kokosi did like a tweet the other day. He was like, oh, we need to have more. Like he posted some basketball drama. Was happening. He was like, oh, people love negative stuff and it's amazing. 100%. The game. And What's interesting, actually, in reflecting on this is we haven't had a politically charged match in a while. And in fact, the the way in which it was charged, the atmosphere was like an internecine fight in the chess world, not the greater world, but within like Fide versus Kasparov. And that was going on from night, you know, since short beat Karpov after the 1990 cycle 
all the way really up until now, it's been a struggle of who, like who's, what's going on in FIDE, who's winning that battle. But before that, you know, Karpov, fortunately, immense political pressure. Karpov, Kasparov, oh, those were immense, immense battles within the Soviet Union with two different ways. It was really the Soviet Union splitting apart with two different factions in a way that battle's still going on, by the way, with Kasparov yelling from outside Russia and Karpov in the Duma, right? Yeah, those two are so still at it. <laughs> that, those guys are still at it, man. And then, of course, Fisher, uh, Karpov. So we've had these epic world historical things going on, and now it's like we're returning to it, and I find it very unpleasant, but... I think I might have found it unpleasant in 72 as well if I had been, I mean, I was barely alive, but if I had been watching it. But in hindsight, it, it's like, oh, what what a great spice to the 1972 match. There's no chess fan who looks back and says, oh, that wasn't cool that there was that tension. Of course, it was amazing. You know? Right. OK, before we move on to the next topic, I want to <laughs> get my thoughts. <laughs> yeah. 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 Go ahead. Uh, good, Kostya. Good. So. I feel like you guys brought up a lot of, I think that was the longest I've gone without talking on Doja Talks. You guys brought up a lot of great points. <laughs> um, I feel like the, the weird wrinkle about all this is that in chess, there's always been this like lineage. There's this classical lineage and the history and tradition is very, very important and cool because you had world champions that were world champions for years and years at a time. And we're yeah. one of the very few sports that really does that. Like one that I would think of is like maybe like boxing has kind of a similar thing to it where you just have like an undisputed world champion and they're the world champion until someone beats them. You don't have this like yearly thing where everyone starts from scratch and starts to win from zero. So that's kind of the odd thing about chess is that this lineage is kind of important, I think, to chess fans. And that's why I also feel like we're just not really going to know whether this counts until history kind of plays out a bit. Like when Kasparov made his split in 19, like 93 or, or wherever, it was, I'm sure, a very confusing time back then. And there was like, no one knows like who the world champion is. Fide's running these world championships, Karpov wins, Anand wins, and so on. But now like looking back on it, for me, it's like, no, Kasparov was a world champion until 2000. Then Kramnik beat him. Kramnik was a world champion until Anand beat him. Anand was the world champion until Carlson. It's like very clear as it played out, even though in this period there was Topalov, you know, there's all these like FIDE world champions and, and so on. So I feel like we need a couple of years just to see what happens. Like let's say Nepo wins and then he wins the next one against whoever. And then he like wins the next one and he's like, he wins a couple of matches in a row. And then finally one of the newer generational kids takes over or Faruja, and and then they become like kind of the new number one. It'll really depend for me on like how long Magnus stays at the top as the number one rated player, who eventually unseats him, whether they become world champion, or we might get a situation where it's like, you know, Nepo wins this time, then next time Caruana beats him, then Caruana loses to someone else, then that guy loses to someone else, and then we just have like multiple winners, right? And then it'll just be one of those, and then I don't know, and then eventually we get a new number one and then they take over again. So I feel like it's just gonna kind of depend how things play out. Right now, it definitely feels like it's, you know, it's a world championship, but it's not a world championship, you know? <laughs> it, it's like a FIDE world championship. That's how it feels like right now. It's a FIDE world championship. So they they own the rights. They can they can have a world championship between Nepo and Karyakin, like if they want it, right? <laughs> like it's like they own the rights. They can do whatever they want. But um, yeah, without Magnus, of course, it doesn't it doesn't feel like it actually, you know, is for the throne. Yeah. Okay. They can win the title, but they can't take the throne. That's my feeling. The difference I would say is at the time of all that stuff, the FIDE World Championships in the nineties I had no doubt about, I don't think most chess fans had no doubt. Whereas this one, I'm I'm still not calling it a world championship match, but in terms of how the history books will be written, I don't know. It's a hard case if I'm going to really, if like, I'm going to be the guy writing the Wikipedia entry. Oh, <coughs> that's hard, dude. That's really hard, man. And I mean, for, it's possible that actually, the world championship title even sort of like dies or becomes obsolete. I'm not saying it's likely, right? But there's a whole different, whole bunch of different ways that history could go. 
right? And like maybe the next time around, nobody wants to play in the world championship. They're all playing some Magnus chess tour online for blitz money that's worth more than the world champ. Like it could go lots of different directions and that'll change (laughs) our perspective on what happened here. Hey, Magnus, buddy, right here. The lineage boss, the lineage. This is not, this is, uh. (laughs) But the world has changed too, Jesse, and we don't know exactly where it's changing to, but I mean, the world changes and different individuals take actions which may or may not sort of catch on and and direct people in a new new direction. You don't know when the world's going to take a turn and you don't know in advance if it's for the better or for the worse. I mean, I love our chess history in a fairly similar way as as you, I think. Um and I'm I'm skeptical of the online blitz events. They're not as interesting to me yet, but you know, it's hard It's hard to know for sure where things will go. And we probably each have a different idea of what would be great, but sort of it will be the collective community that sort of votes with their eyes eventually on what direction they want the chess world to go. Okay, okay. I have some sympathy with that, yeah. All right, let's like, move on. Okay, let's move on. Uh, next topic is Dojo this... Ranks- the top five most political matches of all time. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Ranking the top. <laughs> Is this the most political match um, in history? Um, it is very political. And there is stuff related to Nepo being Russian, Nepo not able to represent the Russian flag. You know, he's playing under the FIDE flag. Um, there's also a question of whether Russia is going to use a possible Nepo victory for their own propaganda and uh, in use. Um, so yeah, there is a lot of uh, kind of political turmoil under the uh, situation. But okay, I can't imagine that this is crazier than like uh, Fisher Karpov. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that this is more of a clash than like Fisher and Spassky. Fisher Spassky, sorry, yeah. Or or even Kasparov and Karpov, which was kind of like an internal clash for the Soviet Union's soul and future and, and direction. Uh-huh. Um, I, I would think those two are definitely more political. Um, what what do you think, Jesse? Well, first, let me. Let me just say something I find interesting about the symbolism of all this. So where it's being held is really kind of interesting, too, in Kazakhstan. So China, Kazakhstan, and Russia are all post-Mongol states. So the Mongolian Empire founded basically all of these countries. And then Kazakhstan was taken over by the Russian Empire as the Mongol state was deteriorating in the uh, 1700s so now and then got its independence in 1990 like a lot of these other countries kazakhstan is now an interesting place where it's one of the places that people can go who are in russia there's very few places you can go go to turkey you can go to georgia i think and you go to kazakhstan and from there maybe you can get a flight out it was a, a very big defection I uh, was talked about recently by one of Putin's main dudes, went out through Kazakhstan. So, and Kazakhstan, is its own loyalty is a little bit unclear. You know, it's trying to play, <laughs> it's trying to play the China card, it's talking to the U.S., it's talking to Russia. <clears throat> so it's this really interesting location between everything, <clears throat> and it's a chess-hungry country. So, um the thing about it where it's political right in so many weird ways is first of all i'm not sure the chinese public cares that much about chess maybe after this they will right my sense is though generally they're go obsessed they don't really care that much about chess despite the fact that they have an amazing chess team maybe maybe the best in the world you could argue um so to me it's like this bizarre thing is now happening and evolving over there. I mean, it's evolving rapidly where it's starting to look like we're getting a new iron curtain, 
right? And Kazakhstan is this country that I think is unwillingly, being unwillingly trapped behind that curtain, then used as a venue, like a neutral venue between China and Russia. Furthermore, China's in this really weird position right now where they are gonna have to start funding Russia. And I think they are already secretly doing it, right? They're not giving weapons, but they are funding them through various loans and, and whatnot because the Russia's in this place of deterioration. Okay, one more thing, I promise, and I'll stop. The other thing that's really interesting is from, I've been able to tell about Nepo is that the dude has uh, very mixed feelings about the war has not been public about it and, and is doing this classic Russian thing where they're like, I'm not political. Like the Russians pretend that they can be non-political. It's a famous trope. And I think one of the weird things though is, I think if you are in Russia right now, the populace is so 100% behind Putin in ways it's very hard for uh, me as an American to understand, because our country is always fractured, right? We're talking like approval ratings well above 90%. And so if you're around that all the time, I mean, you, you're going to end up mirroring that in some way. I think it's inescapable. You can't just like hang around a bunch of yes men and not become infected by that feeling of yes yourself. The feeling aren't of those rejection. Aren't those state approval ratings or what are you talking about? No. I think that's actual? Good. Yeah, those people, Russians are behind this, dude. They are behind this thing. It's really amazing. But there's so many that were like defecting, leaving the country, speaking yeah, out against I mean, it. You, you have the people who, who were against it are gone. Who had a little, and they, who were they? They were the educated people with a little bit of money. And they're now gone. They're flushed from the system. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I'm just trying to say there, one of the things about it, right, is I think, I don't want to go too long about this, but like when you feel like everyone's telling you that you're a terrible person, like we're all telling Russia that they're terrible people, you're going to end up feeling solidarity with the other people called terrible people. And then you're going to join together with this feeling of resentment towards the West. Anyway, it would be very interesting to know where Nepo stands on this. I'm sure he has some very complicated feelings on the matter. Looks like historically Putin's approval rating is always between 60 and 90 percent. And right now it's around 88. It's high. Um, I would guess that the American president's approval rating, by contrast, is almost never over 50 percent and but, yeah. is probably generally somewhere between 15 and 30 percent, I would guess, sort of the inverse. Especially in the last 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's really tough. I, I think Nepo, Nepo definitely did come out against the war. Um, but uh, and I, I remember hearing something recently how like Karyakin hasn't spoken to Nepo and like you know since the war broke out or something. So it's like um, I, I feel like he's in a really, really, really difficult spot. I mean, I imagine you know he's got Ukrainian friends. I, I mean, I fully believe like he's against the war, but he's just put in this impossible position. Like I imagine a lot of uh, Russian folks are where, yeah, they can't really speak out against it too much because they'll get in trouble but at the same time like i mean you you have to keep living your life you know he's a chess player he's been dreaming about the world championship probably for a while so it's like how can he like not pursue his goal so it's very unfortunate um for him and i feel like honestly the whole thing might be like a huge distraction as well I'm not sure which player is going to be like more distracted by the whole thing, but it feels like a huge distraction uh, for both. Well, Ding, Ding is going to be not distracted. I can I can answer that question for you. Uh, and and let's just say the obvious. I'm not so like, sure. Yeah. Uh, Nepo has accepted money from people who are associated both with the state and the war machine. So like, was he forced to do that? Probably not forced, but I you know it would have been hard for him to turn it down on a variety of levels. So again, like a very conflicted position that this dude's in yeah so it's a weird time yeah it's uh it's a weird time um, as far as it being the most political match coast yeah i would say we're just living in an era where everything is more and more politicized right like every single thing every time jesse goes on stream you know he worries that he might get canceled that day 
right? I worry too. I worry too. Every, every time. Every time, you know? And I think every time there's a soccer match, you know, people are talking about, you know, was the women's team paid the same as the men's team? Should, uh, you know, transgender athletes be able to play on the women's team or the men's team or the this or the that? You know, should Qatar be hosting the soccer tournament? Who built the stadiums and, you know, how were they treated? Like, I feel like I'm not necessarily saying this as a good or a bad thing, right? Mm. But I feel like everything is super politicized. I don't think this match, you know, a Russian chess player, a Chinese chess player has any inherent reason why it would be a super political match um, because Russia is currently fighting a war in Ukraine. I think if you look historically, I mean, there have been, you know, what Al Yekin had articles that were published um, during World War II that were sort of pro Nazi. I haven't read them, so I don't know the details. But I mean, there there have been intersections between chess players and their countries and politics and war forever in some way, right? Like whoever, like Lasker was world champion. He was German. You know, Germany was at war probably several times during his tenure as world champion because he was world champion for so long. Yeah, You don't look back and think like, Lasker Schleicher. Now that was like, you know, a political wow, you know, or Lasker Capablanca, you know, a a colonizing country versus a colonized country or, you know, it's just I think it's just that we are imbuing things. We collectively, you know, are imbuing things with more and more political meanings and arguing over all these things. And again, I'm not saying that's that's good or bad. You know, it could be great to to start thinking more about our sponsors and are they the right sponsors or not who knows but i don't think that this match is in some way intrinsically super political not at all i just think it's what people put into it and for ding and nepo for example i i i I really doubt that either of them sees it as a as a political event right whereas i think Fisher had a little bit of, you know, me versus the Soviets kind of thing going on. And I think Kasparov also tried to, you know, maybe just psyching himself up. But I think he had a perspective of him against the old entrenched communist bureaucratic despots, you know. And that still seems to be how he likes to see the world, right? Um, But I think Ding and Nepo are just like we're playing, are, are probably just thinking about playing chess. I don't think they're very political people, either of them. Okay, I'm going to rebut it a little bit. I'm going to say chess world champions have always been political. People are always aware of it. The world championship match after World War II, oh, man, that was a big deal. The Soviets holding on to it forever, huge deal. Fisher breaking that cycle, of course, massive. And it's only been it's the last brief window of time where we had internecine fide conflicts as the political drama. That's That's the exception to the rule. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Lasker was pro Germany, World War Two, World War One, my friend. That was, you know, everything was politically charged. Um, yeah, dude, my God, I think that's just part of part of the beauty, honestly, of the lineage is it's a, it's kind of like where our little world meets the world stage in a lot of ways. It's been that's been the connection to world history has been these matches, and uh, this thing, it's. You could, I, I think it's very political, especially in the ramifications of what's going to happen next. I mean, that's the thing I don't know in terms of the chess world and the world in general. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's huge. OK, Kostya, to you, convince Jesse that Nepo and Ding aren't political. It's just the people watching them. <laughs> I mean, yeah, the, the two players themselves. Right. I don't see them as being politically motivated or anything like that. Yeah. I think they're just chess players. It's more about the background um, of the of the match and like when it's happening. Um, and it's also like, as Jesse mentioned, yeah, it's a little like just interesting how it turned out to be uh, Russia versus China. And like recently Russia split from the European uh, chess union and they joined the Asian chess federation or chess union. Um, and so it's like, yeah, it's very interesting how we'll have kind of like almost like two sides of the chess world that seemingly match the two sides of the real world <laughs> Just in terms of alliances and stuff like that. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it's kind of a weird question because it's not like super important to me whether this is the most political match in history. Of course, it feels more important because it's happening right now and there's going to be more media coverage of everything. Um, yeah, I think it's just important to recognize that there's a lot of um, issues kind of lying under the surface. Yeah. If we, we, when we do our tier list, I'll put it at around four or five. All That's right, what I want to say our tier list. Of most <laughs> okay. Matches. So not the most political match in history, perhaps the most like international collect connected political time in history, regardless of the chess match, right? We're just at everyone's fingertips is information and people are, you know, refusing to go to each other's Thanksgiving dinners because uh -huh. they voted for Trump and stuff like that. Or because they didn't put a Ukrainian flag on their profile on social media. Let me just say, David, I disagree. We can, this is a different topic, so I don't want to say it too long. But I just yeah. disagree in general. That, that's a common trophy here now that things are more uh, split than they've ever been. I totally disagree. Mm. 1850s, way more politicized. You look at even 1972, the country with the hippies versus the, the normies. Oh, dude, way more intense. So I disagree, and I but I recognize it's a common sentiment out there. Okay. Anyway, I don't I don't see any reason why this really is a political match. Shall we talk about FIDE? Yeah, let's yeah, move yeah. on to a more fun topic and <laughs> um, discuss the promotional skills of FIDE. Because I feel like this is an important one. Because all right, they're saying it's a real world championship, right? Let's just go with it for a second. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of like the marketing that the FIDE has done, I honestly, I just don't feel like it's great. And FIDE generally hasn't been known for their incredible marketing skills. But I feel like they're always talking about like promoting the game, growing the game. They're trying to like bring new um, audiences in. FIDE, I felt, was very offended when you know, there was all these articles about like the chess boom and no one, no one gave them any credit for helping with the chess uh -huh. boom. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, they're kind of mocked when, when they asked for some credit. <laughs> um, but it's like, I don't know. It's like I looked at their YouTube channel. They've got, they had like one video promoting the match, like one trailer. You know, it's like, it seems like if this was a huge world championship match, there would be content coming out every day. There'd be videos, interviews with the players, their background, you know, just like little like video biographies. I mean, there would be so much more hype. Like, yeah. So many things you can do. And I don't know exactly what it is. I mean, I, I think there's tons of like good people working in FIDE. Maybe they just don't have enough people working on this side of the thing. There's just like not enough people like producing content for them. But uh, I know like Levy Gotham Chess, he's been like trying to promote the match himself. And he's just like, <laughs> yeah, he's like, I think he's just doing it out of like the kindness of his own heart. <laughs> he's just like, <laughs> he just like, he likes chess. He wants chess to do well. It's I think like, he does it out of, the kindness of his own heart for himself. I think he's trying to promote himself, no matter what he tweets about. No, no, he's he's obviously he's a business guy. He's promoting himself, but he is trying to like promote chess. If people are interested in chess, of course they're gonna watch his content, right? That that's clear. Yeah. But it's like this is Fide's job, <laughs> and then it's like I don't know. It seems like the nowadays, like the influencers, the content creators are gonna be like picking up the slack for them in a way. Mm -hmm. but, I, but they didn't even reach out to the comment creators to ask them to promote it for them you know like they were like hey what what are you saying about our event right i saw them replying to him like what are you trying to say about our event that we did or didn't promote like you know they can't <laughs> it, it's hard to read tone on the internet and all that but they they clearly didn't ask anybody to do anything they didn't go to hikaru and say like please make a video about this they didn't they didn't initiate anything but for example like uh, our friend Mike Klein is over there in Astana, and he posted some stuff about like the opening ceremonies. Like, oh, this is really cool. But people down the food chain, like us, like I, I don't care, dude. I'm not going to retweet it. I'm not going to watch it. They're doing interviews. I'm not going to. I don't care. I don't care. So, like, yes, it's a problem. Fide's never been good at promoting stuff, but in order for it to go viral, you've got to have loads of people retweeting stuff and doing like this. Nobody cares, Bows. Nobody cares. So even if they're terrible at it, I don't think anyone would care. You know? I, I don't think it's true. I don't think it's true. I think if, you just got to blast them with content. Just make them care, right? It's like the match between <laughs> number two, number three players in the world, uh -huh. right? Yeah. They get to call themselves the world champion. I mean, mm -hmm. there just hasn't been a lot of 
stuff to share, you know? Uh, apparently today, like, they are supposed to do, like, the opening ceremony. They had, like, a live broadcast that apparently went dead. And then there was, like, no tweet about it. <laughs> no, like, sorry, guys, technical issues. We'll be back. There's just, not, like, nothing. It's just they were live and then they went dead. And now it's, like, I don't know. Mike Klein is maybe having to tweet from there, like, <laughs> send yeah, us yeah, updates. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's great, but, like, that's not... That's not his job. Like. Yeah. yeah. And actually, Kostya, you mentioned something which I would disagree with Jesse about. You said you suggested that they put out player interviews. I would I would definitely be interested in an interesting player interview mm -hmm. if they could if they could put one out, right? I would love to know what Ding and Nep are thinking about a tons of things. One of the reasons that I may have less interest in just not knowing the players personally as well as some other players you know there's actually other players where you've got more of a sense of you know oh, they're into soccer or tennis and you know this is how they train and stuff and like ding's kind of a question mark i don't know much about him what i mean could you write a one-page essay about dingley wren could i write a one-page essay about ding yeah like like i'm sort of asking like what like do you guys feel like you know much about dude uh, I, I know a little bit, and maybe I'll say something when we get to our final topic of who wins. But I know a, mm -hmm. a little bit, yeah. Okay. Anyway, I would be very interested to see an interview. That would be an example of a promotional material that they could do. And I did say it would have to be an interesting interview, right? Not one of these, like, I'm going to try hard, my opponent's good too. It, not just generic stuff, right? And I know that sometimes chess player interviews don't always come out great. Same for other sports too. But that's potentially something I would be super interested in and which would then increase my interest in the whole match. Yeah, there's tons of stuff. They, they could send a, a person out to their training camps and film some stuff. Like we've seen training camp footage before, but it would come from mm -hmm. like Team Magnus. Like literally Team Magnus produces it to kind of like promote yeah. themselves, whatever, release a fun clip. But it's like FIDE should be doing that. FIDE should be like, hey, let us like film you a little bit. Obviously, you know, they hide whatever sensitive information, right? But, you know, just show Nepo playing some sports, show him playing some blitz. It'd be awesome. You know, same with same with Ding. Just force the players. I mean, FIDE is writing the contracts, right? Just force the players <laughs> to let you do that, right? I mean, I don't know. There's so many things they, they could have done. And it's like, yeah. uh, I know they're trying. They're trying. Um, but you they know. could have Ding take you through a day of his training, right? Like here, we're gonna hit the pool for an hour, right? Now we're gonna like eat healthy food. This is like what I eat. Like here's and he, Ding's personal chef. Here's how I prepare. You know, the noodles that Ding likes, or something like that. You know, like they they could take us. There's so much that could be done. That would have been that would have been amazing. But um, yeah, I don't know. It's like every every. Every promotional like release from FIDE, it's just always like defensive. There's like, here's what we did, and here's why this was all that we could do, and we couldn't do anymore. <laughs> it's like they're always like the victims in their own events. You know, it's it's very strange. <laughs> we didn't organize the FIDE Grand Prix. That was World Chess. It wasn't us. <laughs> like, all right, guys. All right. <laughs> that is hilarious. Always the victims in their own events. <laughs> like, how <laughs> amazing. Okay. Coach, okay. Yeah. So FIDE promotional skills yeah. low. I. Low. At the risk of saying something racist and getting canceled, I think that um, uh -oh. Day's promotional stuff, it's mostly done in English by people who are not native English speakers. It's a little bit odd. I mean, it's a world championship. They could put out materials in many different languages, and they could probably spring for a native English speaker for some of their English materials, or even if not like native English, but like really good at English. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, again, you don't need to be native to be good at a language necessarily. Um, but like unstoppable minds like yeah like what no bueno yeah, i mean I don't, know. Yeah, I don't think you need like you definitely don't need native english speakers to promote a match well i think it's more of just like them not putting the focus on it like they're not they're not delegating enough i think they do have people that would do a great job but it's like someone has to like yeah or chad is saying maybe it. the Maybe the bar could be proficient English speakers. I mean, it's really like, like their stuff comes out and you're like, oh, that was obviously written by somebody who doesn't really speak English. And whoever wrote Unstoppable Minds, it's like a Freudian slip because it's like, wait, you mean Unstoppable if Magnus doesn't show up? Is that <laughs> what you mean, Bows? Also, winning a chess game is nothing about stopping the other person's uh. mind, right? It's not like in like a sport where you like run into somebody and one guy falls over and the other guy doesn't, right? Like, 
You just have to think of one idea that the other guy doesn't think of. And that happens literally every game, even for players at a 2800 level, right? Like mm-hmm. if the people writing this stuff had like the barest understanding of what a chess match is, right? Every single day, each player is going to think of some little detail the other guy doesn't, but how much does it matter? And is it enough to gain an edge and then et cetera, right? I mean, there's nothing unstoppable about, <laughs> about any of this. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, Costa. Are we doing uh, dojo coverage? Okay, let's let's move on. Well, newsflash, Jesse, we're covering the match right now. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> Mind blown. This question is more about whether we're going to um, stream the match or like do recaps or anything like that. So, yeah, Jesse, I think you you mentioned like you're you're not into it. At least at the moment, no. You'd have to give me a hard sell here or something. Yeah. Um, honestly, personally, I don't really have a desire to cover the match. It's not because I'm not interested. I do find it funny. How there is a lot of people that are like, oh, I'm not, I'm not going to watch the match. I'm not going to... Like, you're going to hear about the match. Like, people are going to be following the match. You're going to hear about it on Twitter. You know, Levy's going to do recaps. Like, Chess.com is going to cover it. Like, people are going to cover the match. You're going to hear about the match. As long as you're, like, on Chess Twitter that day, you're going to find out the score. You're going to find out what happened or if someone, you know, blunders badly or, like, does, like, a touch move thing. Like, you're going to hear about it. Um, But will there be as many people, like, watching live as, like, a Magnus match? I would probably doubt that. That said, I do think people will be interested in... um, like recaps and stuff and just kind of hearing what happened. Personally, I'm not super interested in doing it just because I think there's going to be tons of live commentary already. There's going to be live commentary from like Vichy, you know, I don't know, Caruana. Like there's going to be a bunch of people doing live commentary that are going to be a lot more interesting to listen to. Um, and, uh, and then there's going to be tons and tons of recaps. So I don't feel like it's really, you know, my job or my calling to uh, recap the world championship match. Yeah, I mean, when we for the last one, we were definitely there. We had big dojo sessions. That was great, dude. I enjoyed that a lot. But anyways, Dave, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, you both make good points. I mean, I, I agree with Kostya that in a certain sense, that in like a competition sense, we can't compete with Anand commentating on a world oh, yeah, championship we, match. Yeah, give me a break. We had we had great coverage last time. Bows. But I also <laughs> agree with Jesse. We did great coverage of Carlson Nepo. It was super fun. And so... Honestly, from like a business perspective, you know, it, it could make sense to to not cover something that everybody else is is covering when there are going to be others covering it really well. But I would say if I find myself sitting around watching these games for six hours a day, hey, I might as well do it on stream with my buddies, right? And we can like hang out and, and, and talk together, whether there's 20 of us or 200 of us or 16 of us, right? Um, But I, at the moment, I think with the, with the uh with the time zone i don't really see that happening right i mean the games are going to be played from 2 a.m my time i think until about 8 a.m my time Mm -hmm. and uh you know i just don't think it's something where i'm going to flip my life on its on its head but if for some reason i find myself watching the games sure i'll stream it um one thing that's interesting you brought up earlier that I was thinking about david is you you brought up like the question of women's football being paid less than men's and for me where the, that has kind of decided is well the reason they're getting paid left is simply the fans the fans aren't interested in maybe someday they will be and maybe they will the fans will want to pay a lot of money maybe they'll watch want to watch it on tv so there'll be tv rights and all that stuff but at the moment there is and european soccer especially the premier league oh my god the money involved is just insane Incredible money, yeah. So when Magnus makes a claim that like maybe online chess will be the new thing, it's a really a question of well, will, will the eyeballs come? And and maybe they will. Maybe you're right. Like maybe it'll happen. Um, but what's interesting to me, just emotionally, when I think about what I want to watch, I'm far more interested right now, actually, in people who are really going for it um, more than I am of the elite players. So for example. Will Chess Von Doom crack 1,200? Honestly, more interesting to me than this match. Will my student Jamil crack 2,000 chess.com? More interesting than this match to me, right? So there's these other stories that are happening now that, that social media has enabled, 
right? Like before we were watching the top players because the chess media would filter that down to us. But now we're able to follow these other micro stories that have personal intrigue and tales and struggle that to me are just more interesting, right? It's just more yeah. interesting than this match is. So it's like this match has competition now from other sources. Yeah. No, I mean, I agree. Like, I want to see um, chess gains make national master. I want to yeah. see Braden make national master. I, I'm right. far yeah. more interested, honestly, in, in those. It may also be because of our own sort of investment and involvement, right? Like, we spend a lot sure. of time yeah. working on and thinking about how to get people from zero to 1,200, yeah. how to move people up the escalator from 1,200 to 2,200. So it's kind of like a preoccupation of ours to begin with, and then – there's the personal touch of getting to know people and, 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 you know, the trainer player kind of relationship and all that. Mm -hmm. But so, so I agree with you, those kind of stories become more interesting. And when I think, what would I want to turn my life upside down to stream, right? What would I want to stream at 2 AM? Yeah. It would be something like a match between Braden and chess games, you know, yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know, a, a 10 game classical match between them is more likely <laughs> to flip my schedule around than, uh, than being Nepo actually. Well, um, I think it would be, I just wanted to say, I agree. It is fun to, uh, do live coverage with you guys. Um, but that for me is more about like, it's more about us just like analyzing games together. Like that's what's fun. It's not like yeah. the actual match that I'm um, super duper interested in. Um, given the timing though, maybe, I don't know, maybe when I wake up, I'll just stream until the end of the game. Yeah. <laughs> cool. and then that could be, yeah. that could be that. Um, and let me say this other thing, and this maybe starts to, to, to get into our final topic, but if yeah. the games in the match electrify me, like I'm all about chess, you know, like if they play a game that just lights my my fire, that might be it. I might be up every every night after that. Mm -hmm. OK, we'll, well have to see, of, right? Let's um, let's move right along. And ask the next question um, of which winner would be better for chess overall? Who winning the match would be better for the chess world? It's mostly a watch, but I'll go with Ding. Mostly yeah, a watch, same. huh? Yeah. You guys think same. it's it's equal, like close yep. to equal? Yep. Oh wow. You're okay. outvoted, Kostia, so you don't even need to give your opinion. Like earlier in the <laughs> show, you can just. <laughs> oh man, I mean, actually, it is. Um, I feel like it is kind of a toss-up, but not. I'm not sure in the way. I'm not sure if we're thinking about it in the same. In the same way, um, I feel like a ding win would be nice for like chess in China. Uh -huh. And I actually think a ding Magnus match is more likely than a ding or than a Nepo Magnus match right after this. Mm -hmm. Not like a reunification match or whatever, yeah. just in general. If ding wins the world championship, maybe Magnus would be interested in an exhibition match with him, right? Mm -hmm. I think that would be a lot more likely if Ding wins. And then You're getting that would Jesse's be... hopes up. I saw him perk up like, oh, yeah, really? You yeah. think Magnus might come back? Come on, yeah. yeah. I don't know. I feel like if everyone has a price. I mean... <laughs> um, yeah, and, and to me, the, the, the reason I said Ding uh, is that there is a chance. I don't – I feel like China's go obsessed, but there is a chance that there could be an explosion there. So it's a small chance, but because of that, I think that's the reason – that they could go crazy the way China did with a knot. Yeah. Right. Go I agree also, completely. Um, ping pong, someone was telling me. Ping pong is just oh, absolutely yeah, huge. Ping pong. huge. Yeah. Um, so, okay. well, let's, them ha let's, let's change the rules so they play ping pong if there's a tiebreaker instead of blitz chess. Maybe, maybe if Ding wins, we can talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> the issue with the Nepo win, and I don't know if it's like a good or a bad thing for the chess world, but it definitely creates more turmoil because you have like a Russian world champion, but then no one's allowed to say like he's from Russia, he's representing FIDE, but obviously Russia will be using him for their own state purposes. Um, and it's going to be like a whole thing. He might not even be able to play certain tournaments just because, I don't know, he can't travel there or whatever. There's restrictions, there's weirdness. Um, 
but I mean, that might just create like controversy and interest for chess, right? So it might kind of feel icky, but it actually might draw a lot more attention to the sport because it has this like controversial world champion, um, especially, you know, maybe he speaks out against the war and then he has to like leave the country. And it's like this whole thing, right? That could be, uh, that could be a huge, uh, huge, huge story for the chess world. So I actually don't know what better for chess even means um, <laughs> in general, uh, nor do I know who would actually uh, achieve that goal. But it is kind of an interesting question. And I, I guess I want to, one thing we should note is just an informational thing is when Karyakin was very pro-war, was involved and at the top they were doing like full billboards of him in russia and you could see it on social media that they're all pumped up they're still more pro karyakin than they are pro uh, nepo so i think nepo's ambivalence about the war and what's going on has created a situation where they are reluctant to use him uh, at least that's my perception of it so far that they haven't gone russia hasn't gone full propaganda mode on this thing and then they will actually the state will be put maybe in a slightly uncomfortable position if they do have to use it hmm. yeah we'll see okay let's move on who wins i'll go first ding's gonna win this match i have to say i've never been a great fan of nepo and uh one thing i will say i think is the weird deciding factor on this match people we're asking what about ding like what's what's the story Ding is a very interesting player. Working alone, for the most part, doesn't use seconds, as far as I can tell. And we ask him in the interviews, he's always like, well, I did my prep alone. He's just sitting there all alone, all by himself, which is really interesting because when me and David went to China in 2008, we were inspired to do the GM house because the Chinese had a house where they were like living together and training. We were like, oh, that's the coolest idea we've ever heard. Let's do that. <laughs> right. So um, but he hasn't apparently been using that. I think the story of how this match is decided to me depends on health. And so one of the things to think about with Magnus is the guy was blessed with incredible health and fortitude, which you're going to need in a match like this. I think one of the reasons you saw Nepo get obliterated is he's physically soft. He still hasn't fixed his uh, like softness, let's call it, right? He hasn't become fit. On the other hand, with Ding, I think one of the questions I have with Ding is, Ding was involved in a really bad bicycle accident. I've been in a bicycle accident myself. It takes a long time to heal from and there's kind of lasting damage. I don't know what that lasting damage is, but ever since that wreck, dude hasn't been the same, nor has he been following the schedule, the tournament schedule that he was on before. In the last several years, dude has been cloistered behind a Chinese wall and like maybe the games were fixed especially when you had to get his rating up and stuff. So like there were, there's a lot of questions around Ding's health and like what's been going on behind the scenes. Cause I don't think most of us know what his training regime has looked like. And if he told us in an interview, I don't know if I would be able to believe him. Right. So I'm going with Ding, but I think the match will actually be decided on the health and staying power of the two players and just as a question who are you are you rooting for ding like would you prefer ding wins? yeah i prefer ding to win i i don't know why but i think it was the man bun maybe it was the man bun, <laughs> but i couldn't do nepo dude i couldn't do it from the beginning this is something about the attitude this was before russia was a controversial thing yeah and and Ding was has always been a beautiful player and i think before the bike accident there was really a it, I think a common perception that he was going to be the one to challenge yeah. Magnus. And that was that like, he was going to be the next thing. So that's why I really felt like from a talent perspective, the kid was there. All right. How about you, David? Who are you rooting for? And who do you think will win? I'm rooting for the games to be great. I don't care which of them wins. I just want the games to be great. And I think that uh, Nepo, will win the match um provide a lot of good insight like something has been missing for ding uh for a couple years now and if you go back to previous matches where magnus you know played with uh caruana karyak and nepo i think for for maybe five six years i've been wishing that that his challenger were ding mm -hmm. 
you know, but somehow I feel like the time has passed for Ding. Like I feel, well, I mean, it's not because of time. He's not that old, right? It's just he 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 lost something at, at that bike accident, and there's just he hasn't had that that power ever since, as far as I can tell. And Jesse says that physical fitness will be an important factor, and I think that Nepo understands that. And even though that's been a weakness for him in the past, I think he's going to come in in decent shape. I think he has uh, made strides there. Um, Jesse, I don't know if you caught the WR Masters, which was his sort of last tournament before the World Championship match, mm-hmm. but um, he tied for first in that tournament without you know using any of his World Championship prep, and he did it by grinding out. The last game of the tournament in the final round with black you know 70 plus move you know cruncher um i think that the experience with magnus nepo knows what it takes to go this kind of match and people have less and less match experience nowadays so i think that's a big advantage just having been in that match with magnus he had to learn something from it probably had to learn a ton of things from it Mm -hmm. um and I think that he'll have the stamina to go to go the distance now. I think his stamina is going to be better. I think Ding's health is going to be a question. How tough is Ding going to be? He's played very few real competitions in a long time, right? Mm-hmm. Wake on Zay, he was kind of flat. And other than that, he played the candidates and some, some Chinese league games, right, in the last yeah. two years. Um, no, I mean, this is this is not a dude in, who's in his top shape and he's at the lowest rating he's had in five or six years. Nepo's at the highest rating he's ever had in a sea of deflation, right? There's like three or four people. Deflation. There's like three or four people in the top 40 who are at, at high ratings, mm-hmm. right? If you look on average, people are 60 points below their peak in the top. And that's because some of them are aging, right? We don't think deflation is 60 points, but look up and down that list, you know, and these aren't all ancient dudes, but everybody's down some points except for two or three youngsters, right? Nodirbeck, Gukesh, and Nepo. Dude's at his highest rating of all time. So I think um, I think he's in shape. I think he's one of the few people who's in, in dangerous shape right now. Yeah, um, that's a good point. So for me, yeah, I, I think I'm with David. I think Nepo is, is the favorite. Um, there's a couple of things I was thinking about. Like number one, Nepo beat Ding in both of the last two candidates um, with with White at least. I remember what happened in their um, mm-hmm. in their black game. But um, and he also has a better record overall. I was looking at. I think it's like 16 to 11 if you count um, speed chess as well. Um, but yeah, I just feel like Nepo. He's done so well in the last couple of years. Like he's really improved. And I also feel like any tournament that he's in um, that Magnus isn't in, he's just like, he's just always doing well. Um, like, it's actually kind of funny. Like last year's Sinkfield Cup, if you remember, like Magnus kind of started off really well. He beats Nepo in like round two or something. Then he loses to Hans, withdraws. And then after that, Nepo like crushed the tournament. Like, like he and Ferruja ended up tying for first, but Nepo was just like, I mean, he was just dominating. Um, so... Yeah, I kind of feel like he's got the uh, the better chances here. Um, and uh, yeah, it just seems like, you know, you go through this world championship match against Magnus. Okay, it didn't it didn't go well, but like still he was hanging in there. What else could possibly cause you fear after that? Right? It's like yeah. you do a world championship against the greatest of all time. Now it's like, yeah, I think that experience is definitely going to be uh, worth something for Nepo. So to me, he feels like a very clear favorite. Obviously, I don't know if he'll win, but I think uh, he he is the likely winner. Um, and actually, I, I don't really have a particular like personal favorite. Um, I would be more than happy if if Nepo wins. I do feel like he deserves it more of the two. Like he's worked harder. He's played more chess. Like in the last couple of years, qualified for the World Championship cycle, for example, which Ding qualified. didn't really do. Yeah, I mean, so you know, I I think. And I have nothing against him. And I think he's, you know, he's, I definitely feel like he has kind of um, more, let's say, engaging personality. You know, I loved when he, um, 
He went after PogChamps. You know, I defended him back then. I thought that was so good. <laughs> so funny. Uh, I did love it. You know, Popcorn when he went chess, after, right? Uh, Popcorn chess. Popcorn he came up chess. With that? Yeah, that was his. That was his. That was great. Imagine he said that as a world champion, you know? Uh, amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I did love it when he went after Mishra, but, you know, whatever. It's cool. <laughs> I, I, nothing against him uh, personally. Nothing against Ding either, but. Yeah, I feel like if I had to pick one, I'd go with uh, I'd go with Nepo. Okay, cool. All, All right, right, folks, there you have it. I'll oh, just... eight six. I predict eight six for the score. Eight six, Nepo. Eight, six. Nice. God, I'm just hoping that it's bloody back and forth. You know that it's a lot of calculation and a couple slips here and there. Um, yeah. but I'll say this about Nepo real quick. I think that in a sense, although he didn't beat Magnus. He is kind of a logical successor to Magnus because he had that contact with Magnus, right? Even though he didn't win that match, he's the last yeah. dude to play with Magnus. It's kind of like he didn't succeed him the way past champions have succeeded each other, but there was kind of like a like a handoff, right? Yeah. Like Magnus was like, here's my final lesson for all of you. Bops him on the head, you know, car carry forward as you can while I go found internet chess. Yeah, he, he retired Magnus. He lost the match, but he retired Magnus. <laughs> by, <laughs> by being such a chump that Magnus was like, I can't play these chumps anymore. I'm done. I'm done. It's not worth it to me. He's not, this guy isn't Ferocia. I'm out of here. All right, folks, that does it. Thanks for um, listening or watching the, the podcast. Please follow and, and subscribe. Um, but that's going to do it. We'll, we'll, maybe we'll do a, a post-match uh, recap afterwards and, and discuss what happened.